Welcome to the Ramiumptum Ruminations Podcast. I'm the host, Scott. Thank you for giving a brand new podcast a listen. I appreciate you giving me a chance and your time. This is the first episode, The Good Ship Zion. In this podcast, I'm going to deconstruct traditional ideas of Mormon theology and present them in two ways. I think it is healthy to try and understand both ends of the secular and believing perspectives on the church. I myself am in a mixed faith marriage where I would consider myself more secular. and My wife is a believing member of the church. It is unhealthy to look at someone else and tell them that the conclusions they've made based on facts are wrong. Everyone is allowed to look at the same ideas and come to their own conclusions. In my life, I have come to certain conclusions, and my wife, looking at the same details, has come to different ones. And that is okay. There is a difference between disagreeing with someone and being disagreeable. So this podcast, I am going to do my best to portray both ends of the belief spectrum and open it up for discussion from both sides. From the gate, there's one thing that I want to say. I want to say that it is okay to be wrong. It is okay to change your mind at one point in time, come to one conclusion and look at the same facts at a different point in your life and come to a different one. Many of the listeners to this podcast may have gone through a similar experience where at one point in time they believed one thing and later on in life they believed something dramatically different. But nothing changed about the facts of the thing that they believed. Their perspective on it changed. Today I want to discuss a thought experiment. The thought experiment is called the Ship of Theseus. It is very, very old. For those that are unfamiliar with a thought, with what a thought experiment is, a thought experiment is just like a regular one, except the entire experiment is carried out completely in the imagination. The Ship of Theseus thought experiment, as I had said, is, has been around for a very long time. It has been modernized into the Grandfather's Axe experiment and, and other variants. The source that I'm going to quote for this thought experiment is a Greek essayist named Plutarch. He lived in the first century CE. I, I should note that he's not the first one to discuss this, but I just like the way that he phrased it. Here's a quote from Plutarch in the essay Theseus, written around 75 CE. This this version was translated by John Dryden. The ship wherein Theseus and the youth of Athens returned from Crete had 30 oars, and was preserved by the Athenians down even to the time of Demetrius Phalerius. For they took away the old planks as they decayed, putting in new and stronger timber in their places insomuch that the ship became a standing example among the philosophers for the logical question of things that grow. One side holding that the ship remained the same, and the other contending that it was not the same. The puzzle of this thought experiment is, at what point does the ship become a different thing than it was originally? Or... Does it ever become a different thing than it was originally? While not necessary for understanding this experiment, the Theseus that he refers to in this experiment is the legendary figure from Greek history. He's considered the founder king of Athens. If you've ever heard the story of the Minotaur, it's that same guy. 
He's the one that used the ball of yarn to escape the labyrinth that was the Minotaur's lair. Imagine a wooden vessel. Oars, sails, riggings. Over time, as the boat ages, the oars wear down and eventually are replaced with new ones. More years pass, and the ropes fray and are worn and have to be replaced. The sails can no longer be re repaired and, and re-sewn. They have to be taken down and replaced in order to keep the boat functioning. New sails, new rigging. Over time, every piece of the boat is replaced. And not a single board left on the ship is from the original boat that Theseus sailed on. At what point does the ship of Theseus stop being the ship of Theseus? There's a couple of ways to, to look at this. You can say that, that the ship is still the same ship, even if there are no boards remaining that were the original boards. You could say that when the last original board was replaced, the ship became a new thing. You could also say that the ship is the same ship because it's the same ship in function. There are many ways to answer this question. And one of the, one of the fun things about thought experiments are oftentimes there's no right answer. The answer that we come to says a bit more about us than it does about the experiment itself. So I want to discuss this ship of Theseus concept in regards to the Mormon church. And from here on out, I will be referring to it as the good ship Zion experiment. Now, it is uncontested that the theology and doctrines and policy of the church have changed. That is okay. There's nothing wrong with change. Change can often be good. But what do these changes inherently say about the Mormon church? And what can we understand about the Mormon church based on these changes? Now, I've created two short lists that I want to cover about some of these changes just to illustrate the point that the rigging and sails in the ship have changed. Since President Nelson was named prophet of the church, he has released a slurry of changes, a whirlwind of policy changes that have changed the church dramatically, for better and worse. Here are a few recent changes that President Nelson has implemented since he became the prophet. Now, when these changes were coming out, many of the members felt surprised and even exhilarated by the pace with which he was altering the policies of the church. It was an interesting time to, to watch as everything on this ship of Zion was altered. So let's discuss these. This first list I would, I would classify more as policy changes rather than doctrine changes. And that's why I refer to them more as rigging in sails. They are essential to the boat. They steer it and they guide it, but they are, not, they are not what keeps the boat floating. This short list of nine things are recent ones, recent policy changes. The usage of the word Mormon has been deemed a victory for Satan and discouraged among its members. When in the past, it was encouraged by previous prophets to be used in a good light. The LGBTQ plus baptismal policy, specifically with regards to the children of LGBTQ plus parents, with the instruction that children were to denounce their parents' marriage in order to be baptized, and then the subsequent retraction of this policy. Another recent change is home teaching has been rebranded and the instructions were changed to the ministering when the church block shortened to two hours, the emphasis on home-centered learning and the new books to accompany this new direction came out was a dramatic shift in the in the day-to-day -day lives of the members of the church. With the priesthood structure changes, not the priesthood itself, but the class structure, taking the elders and the priests and putting them together in the same classroom, 
the verbiage in the temple was recently changed to be more inclusive of women and in fact encourage a healthier relationship between them and God and their husbands. Missionary communication and the frequency with which missionaries can call home and talk to their families. The witness policy for baptisms, allowing women and children to act as witnesses of the baptisms of their friends and family members. And the last one I'll touch on is the separation of the Boy Scouts of America, where the church stepped away from the Boy Scouts and has been implementing its own youth program for young adults, young male adults, as women are women already had a church, a church led youth program, but the young men had a program which was a cross between a church program and the Boy Scouts of America. Now, as I said before I started listing off these, these changes, many of them are not doctrinal. They are just changes in the direction of the church. They're changes in the organizations. They're changes in, in the functional things, in the day-to-day things of the church. But they don't dramatically change the policies, or pardon me, they don't dramatically change the theology of what the members believe. But regardless of the changes to theology, they are still changes in the church to the point where the youth growing up today have a completely different experience in the church than youth growing up from when I was a kid. And the same is true about when I grew up to when my parents grew up. In each generation, it changes a little bit more. Now, while that list is very interesting, there's another list that is a little bit more poignant and a little bit more geared toward this ship of Theseus thought experiment. As I mentioned in the previous one, those ones were less doctrinal doctrine changes, but this list is doctrine changes. This is not a comprehensive list. I'm only going to talk briefly about five things. If you want to learn more about any of these things, do your own research. Look them up. Look for sources both on the church website, look for sources elsewhere. Try and understand these concepts as best you can. The first one I want to talk about is the Adam-God theory. While Brigham Young was prophet of the church, he taught on a number of occasions the idea that Adam was the son of God and was to be worshipped as our God. This concept has gone through a couple of changes because Joseph Smith actually taught that Adam was the Archangel Michael and he served in a first presidency of sorts in the pre-mortal life. The next one I want to discuss briefly is polygamy. Now, polygamy is a difficult issue to address properly, but the ideology and the thoughts behind its practice and its inception have changed very significantly over the course of the church. It was originally practiced in secret and taught to a select few, and then later openly taught to the members of the church. When the United States put pressure on the Mormon church to change this doctrine, they openly said they stopped practicing it, but then continued to practice it in secret. And then finally it was changed where they were no longer allowed to practice it, even in secret. But a vestige of this doctrine remains, where a man today can marry one woman and be married to her for eternity, and then if his wife dies, he can be married to another woman for eternity. Now this is an interesting bit of misogyny, because a woman cannot be sealed to multiple men, but men can be sealed to multiple women. Another important doctrine change in the church is the race and the priesthood where it was originally there was no concrete doctrine about it and then Brigham Young taught that they were to be withheld the priesthood because of the lineage of Cain and the curse that was put upon him and this curse was specifically their skin color and then in the 70s when the when the doctrine was changed allowing black members of the church to both get the priesthood and have temple covenants. And the last one I want to mention is alterations to the scriptures. The original text of the Book of Mormon has been changed many times over its history. 
as well as the Book of Commandments. When it was changed to the Doctrine and Covenants, there were full essays that were pulled out and removed because they no longer fit with the theology that was being taught. I want to be clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with with a person thinking about their, their doctrine, thinking about their theology, and deciding to change things. I think it's healthy. Change is good. The changes to the race and the priesthood are significant and important, and I am so glad that the church has, has become inclusive. There's nothing inherently wrong with change. I think the problem comes in with how it's presented. The church has put itself into a position where the words of the prophets are literally the words of God, but they so often contradict each other. And so they are forced into a position where they have to dance around ideas and change the verbiage in order to make it still fit with this paradigm that they speak for God. I want to quote an LDS historian named Greg Prince. He did an interview on Gospel Tangents where they were discussing this very idea where the interviewer asked Greg about policy changes and if he foresaw more changes in the future. And this was his response. Greg Prince said, I see virtually anything changing because I have seen everything change. I'm not aware of a single LDS doctrine of any significance that from 1830 forward has gone completely unchanged. You'd think a lot of them would, but it turns out, no, there were some substantial changes in many cases very early on. If you just look at the vision narratives, you see the evolution of Joseph Smith's theology of deity, and it's taking place in a very rapid fashion and in a very dramatic manner. It wasn't just nibbling at the periphery. He was going through evolutionary leaps in the way he portrayed the Godhead. That was reflected in his subsequent retellings of the story of the first vision. Each time he told it anew, it incorporated the then-current version of his theology of deity. That's why those different versions are telling different stories, because they became theological narratives rather than historical narratives. And that was from the interview on Gospel Tangents. They called that interview, Ailing Church Leaders, No Not Ideal Governance. Fascinating discussion, very insightful, recommended reading. On the subject of changes, I've noticed a shift in the Mormon church in the vernacular that they use to discuss the restoration. From the beginning, they've used the word restored, the past participle ed ending, to define what happened when Joseph Smith established the church. When you use the past participle, it's something that happened and finished. In the modern narrative, they've changed from a past participle to a gerund. And I'll explain what that means. The gerund is an ing ending, and it's used to turn a verb into a noun. And instead of something that happened, ed, past participle, it is something that is happening, ing, gerund. Happened versus happening. This idea is fascinating. It frees the church from the concept that they cannot make changes and empowers them to to discuss the restoration as an ongoing process of them constantly reshaping it and fitting it with what God wants for his people. The difficulty of this is it puts them in a conundrum of how to determine when a past teaching is a policy or a doctrine. That is a discussion for another day. I want to circle back with the thought experiment of the ship of Theseus. We've established that the Mormon church has changed every doctrine and every policy from its inception. And these changes started very early on. This is not a debate of if changes are good or bad, or which changes are right or wrong. I simply want to examine it as the ship of Theseus, the good ship Zion. Is the good ship Zion the same church that Joseph Smith restored? 
even though none of the doctrines, none of the policies that we practice today are the same as what was practiced in the early days. In my mind, there are a few ways to look at this, and they will be the same exact few ways that I said that we can look at the ship of Theseus. You can say that no, it is not the same church. You can say that it stopped being the same church when they removed the last doctrine that was a vestige of what Joseph Smith restored. Or you can say that every organism on this planet is constantly shifting and evolving, and that it is the same church, even though it has dramatically different beliefs from its inception. Think about that for a moment. What implications does that have on the way we look at the Mormon church as an organization? One could argue that it is not the same church. One could argue that, that as soon as it changed one thing, it stopped being the same organization. The way I look at this, and I could be wrong, the way I look at this, my interpretation of this thought experiment is, is like a river. I live I live near Portland, Oregon, and I drive across the Columbia River almost every day. When I look at the river, there has never been a time where I have seen the river with the exact same molecules of water in it. But every time I see it, I refer to it as the same thing. It is the Columbia River. But I've never seen the same river any time I've looked at it. The way I look at a thing is that it is a constantly shifting and evolving river. But it is still the same river. And I see the church much in the same way. Just as when you see a river, you never look at the same particles twice when you see it. But it is still the same thing. So even though the Mormon church has gone through countless changes and reorganizations and, and shifts in theology, at its core... It still is the same church. But this, this brings up an interesting idea, because when Joseph Smith died, the church branched off into a couple of different organizations. So the next logical question would be, which of all of these branches is the same church that Joseph Smith restored? Which church has the rights to the heritage of Mormonism? Going back to the river example, if we think about a river that flows down from the top of a mountain, sometimes there are branches and forks in the river, and they lead to different areas. Sometimes they come back and they join each other again. Sometimes they flow off in a completely different direction, never to see each other again. But they still come from the same source, and they still have equal claim to the origin, which is the mountain or the source of this water. So does that then mean that one branch of the river is more valid, has more water than another? Is one branch from the Mormon church more or less access to its origin story? One of the things that is important for adults to remember is that everyone is able to decide what they want about their life and their theology. And that's okay. Now that we've been discussing this from a philosophical lens, I want to bring it back into scripture a little bit. Now in Hebrews 13, 8, we have this verse that says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. This is a scripture that as a missionary, I taught regularly and I fully believed that God does not change. As I've gotten older, I have noticed that there is nothing in this world that does not change. Not a single thing in the world is constant forever. The Mormon church included. Now, does that mean it's evil and terrible? No. Does that mean it's perfectly good? No. That means it's part of this world, and everything in this world changes. Many people, when they see these changes, they look at it from the perspective of this scripture in Hebrews. 
Since it changed, it cannot be of God. And that was the conclusion I made for a long time. But it doesn't have to be. So what if, what if we freed prophets and apostles and scriptures from the burden of constancy and allowed them to be wrong? How liberating that idea is. What if we allowed people to be wrong sometimes? I know I've been wrong many times in my life. And is, is there something terrible about that? Does that make me a bad person because I was wrong or as I have been wrong many times in my life? No, it makes me a person. And it's silly for us to assume that Paul from the New Testament or, or Russell M. Nelson or Joseph Smith or anyone can't be wrong. So this forced me to reassess the reasons that I distance myself from the Mormon church. Could there be a better reason? This forced me to reconsider what about a religion is necessary. Regardless of the conclusions that you come to from this thought experiment, they are valid. One thing that's very important, and I may say this many times on the podcast, is you cannot debate facts. You cannot debate history. You cannot look back on it and change the narrative. History is history. Facts are facts. Where you can debate is the interpretation of them. And it is valid to see and hear everything about the church and decide that it's not good for you. It is also valid to read and learn about the church, see it for what it really is, and decide that it's still a good way to interface with deity. As I briefly mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, my wife is an active believing member of the church, and she and I have studied these things at length. Is there anything wrong with knowing the difficult issues and deciding that, that the church is still a good fit for her? No, that's her decision. If it works for her, it works for her. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, is it valid for my wife to look at me and say, how can he leave when it's so valuable to me? No. No. That's also not an appropriate response. We are both adults. We both make decisions for ourselves. In the recent tweet that has come out from Hannah Syriac, where she discusses what does and does not constitute rigorous research, it got me thinking about an idea that needs to be said when an investigator in the church is studying about Mormonism and deciding to become a member, oftentimes they have not finished the Book of Mormon. They've never listened to a general conference talk. They don't know anything about the modern prophets or the past prophets or really the theology. That's why they go through the gospel essentials classes to learn the essentials. But we allow them to be baptized into the church knowing Nothing. So if we don't require rigorous research to join the church, there is no requirement for rigorous research to leave it. Everyone has the right to look at the facts and make their own decisions. And no one has the right to tell someone else that their decision is invalid. We can disagree with conclusions. We can disagree with, with philosophies and theories. But we don't have to be disagreeable. We need to allow ourselves to be free thinking and expect other people to give us that same right. My goal with this podcast is to push the boundaries both of Mormon thought and post-Mormon thought. My ultimate goal with this is to have people come together, believing and non-believing, 
because there's a discussion to be had. As I was deconstructing the church, my wife made a comment to me that has stuck with me dramatically. When I stopped praying, she continued to pray with my kids. And that's fine. We're in a mixed faith marriage. She's introducing them to the the ideas that she believes. And that's okay. But I wasn't being respectful while they prayed. I would continue to trounce about and open the refrigerator or do whatever it was that I was doing. I wouldn't stop if they were praying. And my wife confronted me about that. She made it clear to me that just because I don't believe in the church anymore or don't believe in the tr- in God in the traditional sense anymore does not mean that I have any right to disrespect her and her belief. And then she gave me an example, and this is what stuck with me. She asked me if I were sitting in a Jewish synagogue or if I was, or I was with someone of another faith. Would I be respectful of them and their belief? Would I sit quietly while they pray, while someone prayed to Allah? Would I be respectful if a Buddhist was meditating? Or would I make a lot of noise and be disrespectful? And of course the answer is no. I would be very respectful to someone of a different belief. And the only reason I was being disrespectful was because of my familiarity with it. We can all be better. It just takes work. I don't want to tell you what conclusions to make about this thought experiment. That is for you to decide. It's on you as the listener to think about it and either incorporate these ideas in your life or disregard them. Either way, I will not be offended. There is immense value in treating others with respect. Thank you for giving a new podcast a listen. I really appreciate your time. I hope that you have found value in what I've said. I hope that it got you thinking that maybe some of these concepts might stick with you for a while. If this is something that you're interested in, discussing philosophy and literature and thinking a little bit deeper about these concepts from a neutral standpoint... I will try my hardest to be neutral, even though I personally might lean one way or another. If you find value in that, please, please like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. As a new podcast, I rely on new subscribers and as many likes as I can get, because that will get this out to more people. And I think there's value in it. I also want to thank Bill Real for giving me the chance to have this podcast under the Mormon Discussions brand. Because I think, as in the name Mormon Discussions, that there is a lot that we can still discuss, both from a secular and a faithful standpoint. Let's learn and grow together and become better people, regardless of where you fall on the belief spectrum. Thank you for listening. I want you to have an excellent day.